going to be talking this morning about truth in advertising. Uh, I actually wrote this a couple of weeks ago before Christmas. You know, there's two times that I absolutely hate watching TV. One is during the election year, as you get closer and closer to the, the actual election, and all you see is campaign, campaign, campaign. The other time that drives me absolutely crazy is right before Christmas when it's all just sales, sales, sales. You know, our, our great buy one 175% off sale kind of thing. <laughs> and I saw a story on the news several weeks ago where they were investigating some department stores for advertising sales and, and they said that the, the stores had not really ever sold those items for what they had marked as the original price to begin with. And I'm watching this news story and I'm thinking, and that's news? You guys just figured this stuff out? Several years ago when Rob Frazier was our youth minister here, just before he and Kylie got married, uh, Dory and I went down, or we are going to get them something for their wedding, and we decided we were going to get them elect, an electric blanket. Rob was always cold. Of course, he only weighed 75 pounds. <laughs> that one's for you, Rob, if you're watching that. Anyway, so we were going to get them an electric blanket, and I went over here to Walmart, and I found a Sunbeam king-size electric blanket for like $80 or something like that. But I had heard on the news or on the radio that J.C. Penney's was having their white sale, and all their betting and stuff was seventy percent off. I'm thinking, cool, I'm not spending eighty bucks on a blanket that I can get seventy-five percent off on over there at J.C. Penney. And so I went down to J.C. Penney, and I found the exact same blanket, seventy percent off, for eighty-nine dollars. <laughs> That's nine dollars more than the regular price at Walmart, and I want you to think about that. Is anybody real quick on math here? Do we have any accountants that can do math in your head really quick? And I want you to think about what was the original price of that blanket at J.C. Penney if at seventy percent off it was eighty-nine dollars? Any of you know? About two hundred ninety-seven dollars. That was their regular price, and Walmart's regular price was $80. Now, does that seem a little fishy to you? Walked into a store a couple of weeks ago, and you walk in, and there's a sign that says, All furniture, 30% off every day. I mean, are we really getting a good deal on stuff? I mean, can you really trust this advertising stuff that we see all the time? They, they need to <laughs> I have really never trusted sales advertising since my whole J.C. Penney ex encounter. But, you know, when I buy something anymore, I don't look at what the sale price is on it. I don't look, you know, I don't go to places and say, oh, they're having a sale and I'm going to get a really good deal because I, a lot of times I don't know if I'm getting a really good deal or not. Have you ever bought something and then found out that you paid way too much for it? Yeah. Absolutely. And so now, if I'm buying something, especially if it's a big ticket item, something that's going to cost me you know, quite a bit of money, before I buy it, I will talk to somebody who's got some experience in that purchase. Uh, things, you know, like there are things that before I buy them, I call my brothers. Because my brothers, you know, buy and sell a lot of these things. Uh, such as firearms, and, and so if I'm going to purchase a new firearm, if I find one that I want, I'll call them and I'll say, hey, I found this, and this is what they're asking for, it. and they'll either laugh or they'll tell me, hey, that's a pretty decent price, you know? And I can trust because they know what they're doing. You know, when we buy a house, uh, I'm willing to bet most of you, when you're buying your house, I mean, you, you're going to go up to the realtor, I mean, imagine going up to him and saying, is this really the best price? I, can, I mean, is this really a good price for this house? And I want you to imagine the realtor saying, well, they're really asking about ten grand too much. I mean, that's not going to happen. 
or go down to the local car dealership and you're getting a brand new car and you ask him, you know, hey, is this really a good price on this car? And he said, well, not really, but if you'll haggle with me for another couple of hours, I could probably knock another grand off of it. I mean, they're just not going to do that. If you get a repair work done on something, I had a, uh, my old Dodge pickup, the brakes went out one morning as I'm driving to town. That was a fun trip. <laughs> You know, because all of a sudden I'm out by the airport and I hit the brakes. There's no brakes. And so I drove all the way to Farm and Fleet to have them checked on for me. And I get to Farm and Fleet and they want to replace my entire brake system. Everything. A couple of thousand dollars. I didn't like that. So I drove my pickup with no brakes up to a guy in Orion that I know. And he looked at it and he said, yeah, he said you got a hole in one lot. I can fix it for 40, 50 bucks. You know, we just you don't trust people unless they're people you know, right? If if you've got a friend that knows something about fixing your washer, fixing your car, fixing your roof, whatever, you're more likely to trust that they're going to give you a good price on something, right? Now I want us to take this over into uh, kind of a religious or a, or a church setting. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we, we started looking, or actually it's been four weeks ago now, how Jesus gives his disciples stories to tell. Stories about how, what he's done in their life, stories that they've seen what he's done in the lives of other people. And then the week after that, we talked about how Jesus taught his disciples that the, their kingdom life must be top priority over everything else. And I think the reason Jesus has been doing this is because he has expected from the beginning that it's his disciples who are going to go out and tell people about the kingdom of God. Jesus doesn't have hire an advertising firm to go out and promote his message. He doesn't hire professional speakers to go out and share with the world that, that the kingdom of God is near. He tells his disciples. He gives them the stories. He gives them the information. He equips them to go out and share with the world because the world will listen to his disciples more than they'll listen to somebody that's hired to peddle something. You know, the reason we don't trust people like real estate agents, and if I'm, I don't mean to offend any real estate agents or car salesmen or anything like that, but the reason we're leery is because we know that they're making a commission. Right? And so if we know they're making a commission, we wonder if we're really getting the best price. Any of you ever bought a house and always kind of wondered if you paid too much for it? Or bought a car and wondered if you paid too much for it? <coughs> a washing machine, a dryer, a TV, anything like that? Any of you ever, after you bought it, you wondered, did I pay too much? Okay. Those of you that never questioned it, you're buying my next stuff for me. <laughs> well, I want you to understand, and I think Jesus understood this as well. People, when you come to, to in, other, in some way, to sell them the kingdom of God, they will listen to you more than they'll listen to me. Because a lot of people in this world look at preachers as working on commission. The more people I can get in here, the more my salary is going to go up. So I want to sell you something to get you here. But you, who are their friend and their co-worker and their neighbor, they'll listen to. Because you don't have anything to gain by sharing the good news of the kingdom of God with them. And you've got stories to tell them because you can tell them what God has done in your life. And you can tell them what you've seen God do in the lives of other people. And they'll listen to you because they don't think you have anything to gain from it. So often I run into people who say, who say, you know, Lance, i got this friend I've been talking to him about. But if you'll come talk to him, I'm sure you can convince them. And I'm like, they don't know me, but they know you. Jesus, I think, in, we're in Luke chapter 10 this morning. If you want to go ahead and turn there, Luke chapter 10 uh, is on page 734 in your pew Bible. Luke has been, or Jesus has been equipping his disciples 
to go out and share with the rest of the world the good news that the kingdom of God is near. It's right here. And in chapter 10, verse 21, I want you to read that with me. It says, at this time, at that time, Jesus, full of joy, through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. You see... Jesus praises God because he revealed the good news to just the common, everyday people. Those who had friends and family, those who had struggles and hardships, those who needed the good news. And that was Jesus' intent was to share this with them so they could go share it with others. And Jesus says this right after he has sent out the 72 and they have come back and reported to him what an awesome thing had happened when they'd gone out on their missionary journey. And so I want us to go back into chapter 10, the first of it, and I want us to kind of look at the instruction and some of the things Jesus does and says to them as part of their training. And here's why this is important. You, if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ... It is your responsibility, your calling, your marching orders to go out and share the good news of the kingdom with those you come into contact with. It's not the job of the hired professionals to do this. It's the job of the disciples. And he's given you stories to share with them, things that he's done in your life, things you've seen him do in the lives of others. It's your responsibility to go out there, but we're often hesitant to do so. And so I want us to see the instructions Jesus gives to the disciples, the 72 he sends out. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 4 says, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Now, we want to keep that in mind, and I'll come back on it in a little bit, but he sent them to the places where he was about to go. And he told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. Three things that, that I see in this text. First of all, Jesus doesn't send them out as powerful conquerors. He sends them out as sheep among wolves that don't really have any power or authority, he sends them out in some ways just as who they are. And he says, don't go out looking all rich and fully supported and everything. I read an article once that, that said one of the problems churches have when they send missionaries to foreign countries is they send these missionaries into places that are that are broke and they're destitute and the people don't have anything and all of a sudden these missionaries show up and the churches want to make sure that they look the part. They dress in a suit. They have the nice haircuts and they've got nice shoes and they've got a nice watch and they've got an iPad and they've got all this stuff so that the people will look up and say, wow, that's what I want. Jesus says, I don't want you to take anything that makes you look as if this is a financial game. I want you to go without anything. I want you to trust in me. And then he says, don't talk to anyone on the way. In other words, don't get distracted. You have a job to do. Don't get sidetracked by anything else. Just go and share with people the good news of the kingdom of heaven. And so in verses 5 through 7, he says, When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. And if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Now, I think this is interesting because Jesus says when you go to a town, you go into a house, and I want you to stay there. Say peace to this house. If there's a man of peace, it will return to you, or it will stay there. If not, now I want you to think about this. If the person you're staying with doesn't like you, our first reaction will be to what? To leave and to go somewhere else. But what does Jesus say to do? Stay there. 
In other words, sometimes when we go out to share with people the good news of the kingdom, it's not going to be comfortable. People aren't always going to be receptive of us. But we have a task to do, a job to do. And so we remain there and we are appreciative of what we get and we continue to do the work that we're called to do. And then in verse 8 and 9 he talks even more uh, about the task, what you're supposed to do. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. And here's what you're supposed to do. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. That's our task is to help those who are in need and tell them, hey guys, the kingdom of God is near you. It, it's kind of like when you find a good deal on something, and as soon as you get home, you call your buddy or your neighbor or something, you say, hey, dude, you got to go down to Menards, man. They've got nails on sale at an astronomical price or whatever it is, and you can't wait to share the good news with somebody. Well, the good news of the kingdom is that same way. Man, I have found something absolutely awesome. It's absolutely changed my life. And you got to get in on this. That's what it means to tell people the kingdom of God is near. Man, it's, it's right here for us, guys. And you got to get in on this. And so that's what we are to do. We're to recognize the things that are going on in people's lives that we can help with. And we're to share with them the good news. Share our lives, our stories with them. But it's not always going to be easy. And it's not always going to be well received as we see picking up in verse 10. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your feet of, this, of your town that sticks to our feet we will wipe off against you. Yet, be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I'll tell you the truth, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Even when they reject you. The truth is the kingdom of God is near. Amen? You can receive it and be blessed by it. Or you can reject it and face destruction. But the truth is it's near. That's our message. And that's what we tell people whether they want to hear it or not. We tell them the good news of the kingdom of heaven. He goes on and he says, Woe to you, Chorazan. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. He who listens to you listens to me. Who, who rejects you rejects me. He who rejects me rejects him who sent me. See, this is not just about Jesus. It's about what God has done by sending Jesus into the world. God wants to be involved in our lives. He wants to make changes in our life. And He wants to make changes and be involved in the lives of our friends and our neighbors and our co-workers. And that's what we need to tell them. And so that's what the disciples did. And then they returned with joy because they had now seen even more of the examples of what God had done and could do and would do. In verse 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. I mean, it is amazing the things God will do when we just go out and do what He's called us to do. But then, as men often do, they had some wrong ideas about what their mission was and what its success was. And so in verse 18 through 20, Jesus replies, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And I don't know, I don't think Jesus is referring to when Satan is cast out of heaven. I think Jesus is just referring more to the fact that he knows Satan is powerless. And maybe he's saying, you know, yeah, while you guys were out, I saw how powerless he was. I saw that he was not accomplishing anything. He was cast down from heaven. I don't know for sure, but I can try to picture Jesus saying something like that. In verse 19, he said, I have given you authority to trample on stakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You know, 
as we go out and we share with people the good news of the kingdom, we'll be met with some rejection, right? That's just going to happen. Happen with Jesus. It'll happen with us too. We'll, see, we'll have some great victories. We will see people whose lives are changed and transformed by the kingdom of God. And that is so awesome too. And we can begin to think, wow, look at what I did. But that's not what's really important. What's really important is that my name is written in the kingdom of heaven. What's really important is that God has reached down and He saved lands. And if we keep that in mind, and we always remember what God has done, and that He's lifted us and He saved us, that just makes us want to share it all the more. Amen? And that's what we're called to do. So, Jesus knows that Satan's powerless. He tells them so. He reminds them of what's most important. Now let me ask you this. Did the disciples, when they went out, did they fully understand everything about the gospel? No. Did they know everything about God's kingdom and all that that entailed? No. What they did know was that the kingdom of God was capable of transforming people's lives. They had seen what it had done. And they had witnessed it. And, and that's what they were supposed to do, is just share with people what they had seen. Look back in verse 9 again. Heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. That's what we're supposed to do. It's the first step in bringing people to Christ. Now go back into verse 1 again. In chapter 10, verse 1, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others, and He sent them out two by two ahead of Him to every town where He was about to go. Wednesday nights, we're doing this book in Mark Toomey's class, Pilgrim's Progress. And Pilgrim, or Christian, in the book, uh, meets a guy named Evangelist. And Evangelist tells him, because the Christian realizes, man, there's something wrong with my life. I, you know, I've got this big burden that I'm carrying, and I know that something's not right. And so this guy named Evangelist says, you see that wicked gate over there? And he says, no, I don't, I don't see it. It's so far off. And he says, well, it's by that big bright light over there. Go over to that wicked gate. That's where there's answer. That's where there's hope. And that's pretty much all evangelist does. This is, is point him in the direction and he takes off. And he gets off track once and evangelist comes back to him and says, see that wicked gate over there? Dude, that's where there's hope. That's where there's help. And that's what we do when we go out into the world. You know, you having struggles? Well, let me tell you something. The kingdom of God, that's where you're going to find the answers. We don't have to have every answer about it. We just point them in the right direction and send them off because then God comes along, Jesus comes along, and He can take them from where we've begun to work and He can bring it to completion. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you want to flip over there with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, Paul says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. See, our job is not to make sure that people are converted. Our job is to just tell them, hey, man, I know the answer for what's going on in your life, and it's the kingdom of God. And we point them in the right direction, and then we allow God to bring about what needs to take place. So here's what we need to do. And I think January 1st is an awesome day to look at this stuff and decide that we're going to do a little better at this in the coming year. So here are a couple of things I want you to write down somewhere and think about and focus on. First thing is to realize what we have witnessed. I want you to spend some time this week thinking about what God has done in your life. What you have seen God do in the lives of other people. Go back into chapter 10, or in, in, he, in Luke again, verse 23 and 24. 
Then he turns to his disciples and he said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see but did not see it, and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. Guys, you and I have seen the kingdom of God work in this world like the prophets of old only wished they could. And we need to realize that. We need to start recognizing what God is doing in the world because He is still working and we've experienced it and now we need to tell others about it. That's the second thing. First is realize what we've witnessed. Second is tell others about it. And the people that you work with, your friends, your family, your acquaintances, they're going to trust that you've experienced something. They're going to trust that God has worked in your life because they'll see it in you. And they'll believe it coming from you a lot more than they will listening to a sermon or something else that's out there. They're going to hear it from you. You are Christ's disciples. You are His witnesses. You are His messengers. You know, as a kid growing up with the experience I had, uh, my view of church was, was really that church was where you went to learn all of the rules, all of the things you couldn't do that would really make you happy but God didn't like. Okay? And that was kind of my view of church. The church is where you went to find out how, how terrible you were and how all of the thoughts that you had were evil and how God really didn't want you to be happy. He just wanted you to follow His rules. That was my experience with church. And I will tell you, I meet a lot of people and that's their view of church. It's a place where you go to learn all the things you can't do to have fun. And it wasn't until I started meeting people who said, you know Lance, I was broken once and God healed me. I was weak and God gave me strength. I was hurting and God made me whole. I was blind, and God made me see. When I started hearing those stories, I started realizing church isn't just about learning the rules. <coughs> church is where we come and experience the kingdom of God right here in our midst. God wants to touch your life. He wants to bless you. Have you let him? If you haven't, you are missing something absolutely phenomenal. And so we're going to give you an opportunity this morning to experience that. To, to really let God do something in your life. Chuck's going to lead us in a song. And if you would like to let go and let God, we're going to invite you to come down here to the front. We'll help you in any way we can. Because guys, this year, I really want, not just you, but everybody you know to experience the kingdom of God. So if you need help with that this morning, please come forward while we stand and sing this song.